Okay, good afternoon and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm mostly going to read, but I'll brought a lot of images so that we can discuss throughout uh, my presentation. What I'm going to present today is uh, based on two research projects. One project on history and history teaching in Portugal, uh, analyzing um, compulsory schooling history textbooks, which finished four years ago, but which I, I still continue to do research on, and we just published a, a book in Portuguese now, a, a Portuguese translation of that research last week. And another project, which is a European project on racism and anti-racism in Europe, which was coordinated at the Center for Social Studies by Boaventura de Sousa Santos and Silvia Meazo. And I'm going to draw as well on that research and my previous research experience, uh, especially on questions of racism in education. So Portugal had the longest process, and I, I'm trying to address here an international audience, and so I decided today not to go so much into detail into my analysis, but to bring you a, a broad overview of my research on the colonialism and anti-colonialism. So for those of you who do not know uh, the history of Portugal, Portugal had the longest process of colonialism in Europe, and was the last country to grant independences to its former colonies, something which happened only a after a bloody so-called colonial war in three fronts, in Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea, and that lasted over 13 years, <coughs> and a coup d'etat by the armed forces in Portugal in April 74, which restored democracy after nearly five decades of dictatorship by Salazar's new state regime. In this communication, I will focus on contemporary processes of institutional and social forgetting of colonialism, and anti-colonialism as well, in Portugal, and which I think are crucial to understand current institutionalized racism, anti-racist struggles, and the contemporary obstacles that these are facing. I would like to highlight two key theoretical works that have been crucial to this research. First, work by Kwame Nimaku and Stephen Small, who have addressed questions regarding the social and institutional forgetting of Atlantic enslavement, focusing on public history and collective memory in European contexts as well as the United States. Their analysis of the current memorialization of enslavement reveals the highly racialized nature of social remembering and social forgetting, as well as the segregation in knowledge production and dissemination at the heart of such processes. The collective remembering of slavery, they argue, is carried out as a consequence of the political struggles by racialized populations and is particularly visible at community level, having mostly emerged as a reaction to the social forgetting going on at national level, both socially and institutionally. A second key work that I would like to bring, uh, and I would like to highlight here, is that of Michel Frof Troyot, Silencing the Past, uh, published in 1995, which is crucial to understand the production of silences in history and historiography around colonialism and enslavement, and uh, he uses the revolution of IT as a case in point. Truyot sees these silences as having been established more broadly, and I read, an overall sketch of world historical production through, through time suggests that professional historians alone do not set a narrative framework into which their histories fit. Most often, someone else has already entered the scene and set the cycles of silence. This highlights the key importance of wider political, economic, cultural, and social factors in the production of historical knowledge. Since Truyot's book was first published in 1995, we certainly came a long way, haven't we? Surely, the previously forgotten revolution of the IT, the first independent nation resulting from a slave revolt and taking place in the uh, end of the 18th century, beginning of 19, now features not only in historiographical accounts, but also in the textbooks of contexts such as the United Kingdom. The images displayed in the slide are from the textbooks of the School History Project in the United Kingdom, and it should be mentioned that there, textbooks are not so often uh, used. So, I mean, there will be an exception to, to, to um, class resources. As this next image reveals, IT is also the context chosen, along with Arab countries, to illustrate modern slavery, a problematic concept which has tended to be deployed to downplay the role of Atlantic enslavement in nation formation and overdevelopment in Europe. So you sort of acknowledge the slave-resistant processes that were taking place in IT, just to say in the next page that, you know, look, where can we find modern slavery nowadays? In IT. So they already brought it to themselves. So this, this kind of ontological idea that some people are more apt for enslaving others. So, for instance, there's absolutely no mention to this idea of modern slavery in the Western world. 
Let us now turn, and sorry, this, what I wanted to highlight here is the operation of these formulas of silence which allow for the inclusion of content, you see the content on the, revo on the revolution of the IT and processes of resistance, which for instance in the Portuguese case did not feature, <laughs> but you have the inclusion of this new information, so-called new, without a change in the master Eurocentric approach that provides the whole books, and this is what I'm going to address here. So let us now turn to the Portuguese context to analyze in detail the operation of such formulas of silence around colonialism. There was some problem <coughs> formatting here, but so this is a state against uh, forgetfulness. On June 10th, 1971, the day at the time it was called the Day of the Race in the new state dictatorship in Portugal, the City Council of Coimbra, where I come from, inaugurated the Square to the Overseas Heroes a designation that endures and which includes this bronze statue that honors the Portuguese soldiers who were then fighting in the overseas colonial war against the national liberation fighters in Africa. The statue represents a uniformed soldier walking with a gun in his right arm, while with the left he holds a black child that he carries on his shoulders, a bit embodying the, the white man's burden kind of idea. With the construction of a shopping mall, a football stadium for the Euro 2004, and a sports complex, the square was reduced in size, but the statue was maintained and officially re-inaugurated in 2005. At that time, when Portugal had just celebrated the 31st anniversary of the revo revolution of 74, which restored democracy, the newspaper Publico, a high-profile national daily broadsheet, celebrated the event with the title A Statue Against Forgetfulness. Criticism of the monument circulated and of the inauguration, including by the well-known specialist in the history of the new state, Fernando Rosas, in the same newspaper. Rosas denounced the colonial revival fueling the initiative. In his view, the monument was a gesture of apology and legitimacy of the colonial war, promoted by three years of right-wing governments, and I quote, the heroism of the war and of the combatants, the recovery of colonialism and colonial war as key moments in the historical continuity with the past of the discoveries in the Portuguese expansion, the condoning of Salazarism as mongering the homeland, homeland defense war, the undisguised glorification of the empire, all were openly recurring themes of the passage of the extreme right through power with the active support, it should be noted, of the commands of the armed forces who, who staged the coup d'etat, who have always been actively associated with this kind of discourse and its related events. At the time, Kozic constructed the debate as a matter of right versus left politics. The examples I bring here today, taking place in the left-wing and right-wing governments, illustrate that the memorialization of colonialism and anti-colonialism and the silences that shape them surpasses the narrow confines of party politics. So let us go back to Trouillot, and from his analysis of the treatment of the Haitian revolution in re written history outside the IT, Trouillot reveals two families of tropes, both constituting formulas of silence. So he distinguishes formulas of erasure, which are formulas that tend to erase directly the fact of a revolution, such as the revolution of the IT or resistance by the enslaved. And this kind characterizes mainly the generalists and the popularizers, textbook authors, for example. And then he talks about formulas of, formulas of banalization or trivialization, which tend to empty a number of singular events of their revolutionary content, so that the entire string of facts, non for all sides, becomes trivialized. These are the favorite tropes of the specialists of the times, overseers and the administrators in Saint-Domingue, or politicians in Paris. Whilst I think it's very useful analytically to, under, to understand how these formulas accommodate critical voices, I argue that this distinction is becoming more blurred as social mobilization also promotes a readjustment of hegemonic narratives on history. So let us now examine an example of erasure. And this is from Portuguese history textbooks. The painting Dance of Black People by Flemish artist Zacharias Wagner, who lived in the, 20, in the 17th century and was also a soldier in Dutch Brazil, is seen as attesting for the presence of religious and cultural expressions of black people in Brazil at the time. The figure is included in history textbooks with the subtitle Black Slaves Dancing on a Holiday. Nothing is said about the struggles led by the enslaved or about the maroon communities they formed at that time in history, namely the maroon of Palmares, Quilombo de Palmares. Rather, the inclusion of such images contributes to the idea that the enslaved were treated with some dignity and could even enjoy some free time. Violence, if at all featuring in textbooks, 
is implicitly portrayed as resulting from abuses in the system of enslavement and increasingly inter interpreted in the framework of individual human rights, so as a violation of the rights of individuals. This is framed within the wider context of national narratives on Portuguese colonialism as soft, benevolent, and characterized by intercultural relations, a key message in the work of official institutions in Portugal. Further, this is sustained by the absence of engagement with racism. Except for one of the textbooks we analyzed, there is no indication of the racist Portuguese colonial policies put in place during the 20th century, with racism being only mentioned in relation to the British, French and Belgian cases. So what we can see is a wider cycle of silences around colonialism, which dismisses the violence of this history, as well as the relevance of processes of resistance such as national liberation struggles. Also, except for one of the textbooks we analyzed, there is no indication of the racist colonial policies. This, is framed, this approach is framed within the wider context of narrating Portuguese colonialism as soft, and which we can see here embodied in this work published by uh, the, the High Commissioner for, it was called like that before, High Commissioner for Immigration and Cultural Dialogue, now it was renamed as High Commissioner for Migration. And in this book, for instance, and in this collection that was launched, Intercultural Portugal, it states at a certain time, intercultural phenomena were born in the most unlikely situations and places, and times inhospitable to their formation. See, for example, slavery, mother of many of the intercultural societies in the Americas, which we see as a clear example of the depoliticization of history. This is not an isolated case. Rather, it has been the preferred approach by policy and decision makers. As you can see in the excerpt on the su suggestion of the persistence of racism in Portugal after a visit to the country by the UN Committee of Experts in the year of the uh, sorry in the International Year of Afro Descendants in 2011, that colonial history, supposedly characterized by intercultural relations, is constantly deployed by the Portuguese state as a means of indefinitely postponing the discussion on racism. While in the previous slide we could see the operation of formulas of erasure deleting colonial violence and resistance by the enslaved, here we can see how critiques are neutralized by formulas of banalization or trivialization deployed to narrate the national liberation movements in Africa, especially in the 60s and the 70s. In this case, it is not that independent struggles are totally erased, but that their significance is constricted in such a way that actually contributes to their understanding as devoid of a political program, as murderers in nature, and these kind of images that you see on the left are very striking, uh, and as having absolutely no positive impact on the metropolitan context, and namely of having absolutely no contribution to the restoring of democracy. This is achieved along the victimization of the white Portuguese in the African colonies, particularly through the use of images showing the death of or injured soldiers and the hopelessness of families of colonial settlers who had to return to the mother country following African independences. The humanity of those fighting for independence or the contribution of freedom fighters to restore democracy is thus erased. As I mentioned earlier, there have been some efforts to add new content. Allowing for multi-perspectivity, a methodology fostered by the Council of Europe aiming at confronting different and conflicting views of a single historical event. And yet, no significant change has been achieved. The current selection and arrangement of information, and I brought like a full page here of a textbook, in which you have included, and this is a very common narrative formula in Portuguese textbooks now, you contrast the perspective by Salazar, the dictator, with the perspective by Emilcar Cabral, one of the leading figures uh, in the national liberation um, struggles. And so you have two positions in, in uh, contradistinction. Whilst you have a sort of an arrangement which legitimates a specific perspective. So when you look in the top, you see the pictures always portraying the white soldiers as victims of black violence. When you look on the left, the graph is counting the kind of uh, economic losses that the war caused in metropolitan Portugal. So there's no accounting of the debt or the losses in the colonial side. And then the exercises that are proposed below ask students to engage with someone who fought in the war, always sort of presupposing that he's white, okay? So even though there is a multiplicity of perspectives, you know, formally, actually we think that, you know, they're not competing on an equal ground. So what I'm arguing for is that we need more than just this 
you know, uh, empty plurality of perspectives approach. We need a change in the national narratives, which has been a key demand by grassroots collectives here in Lisbon. And I brought one, well, the picture is gone. Okay. And I brought um, uh, um, an excerpt from a text by Plataforma Ghetto, uh, which is a, a collective here in Lisbon, and uh, they wrote this text uh, in reaction to the celebrations of the 25th of April, and this text is illustrative of the demand for the reconsideration of the African subject in history and in contemporary politics. And I read, the 25th of April, of April so we're referring to the 1974 revolution, is a noble day to... Sorry, this plane <laughs> is a bit noisy. So the 1974 revolution is a noble day to dates in the history of Portugal, in universal history, and particularly in contemporary history. But to think that this event represented a milestone established only by the Portuguese armed forces ultimately reduces the importance of such an event. In this sense, we propose here a broader reading of the possible causes of this historic event. Thus, we thoroughly reject the idea that the 25th of April embodied a mere military revolt or expression of discontent by, by the military. This perspective makes it a social epiphenomenon circumscribed in a specific historical time. Africans did not need the 25th of April to free themselves from the colonial yoke of imperialist and capitalist exploitation imposed under the auspices of Portuguese colonialism. Guinea-Bissau, for example, had unilaterally declared within the United Nations General Assembly, sorry, I skipped a line, had unilaterally declared independence in 1973, a year before the revolution, and this was recognized immediately within the United Nations General Assembly by about 80 countries. We do not accept a reductionist vision of such a phenomenon that seeks to whitewash the facts and disregards the liberation movements. And yet, this is not just an intellectual matter. These struggles are much about representation as about access to power and resources in housing, education, healthcare, and against racist police violence. While the challenge in education is crucial, what is at stake is a much wider scenario of historical constitutive and equal relations based on race, which impacts on education at all levels, and as Christina will address, in special segregation, in processes of academic selection, in teacher expectations, in the curricula and canons of knowledge, in disciplinary surveillance and punishment, and so on. And so I end with the quote by Emilcar Cabral, always bear in mind that the people are not fighting for ideas, for the things in anyone's head. They are fighting to win material benefits, to live better and in peace, to see their lives go forward, to guarantee the future of our children. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank the invitation of the EDIT group and uh, uh, I will I bring a, a presentation uh, about uh, the Afro-descendants in the Portuguese educational system. Uh, I will talk um, about some of the statistics, official statistics that uh, say a lot about the situation of Afro-descendants in, uh, in the educational system. Um, this work, it's not um, a, a final product of a research. It's a, an ongoing research that uh, it didn't start just with my PhD, but, but uh, in some way, it, yes. But with the other researchers and projects that I have been um, with other teams, with other people, so I'm always uh, trying to accumulate uh, more and more knowledge. And um, spaces like these... Uh, uh, been discussing these um, these results and and can always always bring new ideas for for this work. Um, one one part that has been very interesting in this in this uh, work has to be with uh, some different spaces where I've been discussing these results out of uh, academia and uh, trying really to address Afro descended public. Uh, because it's very hard to, to, to do it and to find them in, in, in Portugal. So like, like today, we, we, <laughs> I think we are two here, no, three, we are three. Um, so it's, it's uh, an effort that gives me a lot of pleasure and uh, that really brings uh, new ideas for, 
for the for the research, but also for what does it mean uh, to make science, to have all this knowledge, and for what does it, uh, what is the use of all of all this? Um, in Portugal, we don't gather information about ethno ethno racial uh, origin. Uh, in some places in the world, yes, but not in Portugal. It's considered a, a sensitive question, like religion. But actually, we we gather information about religion in in a census. So um, I think there is a space for us for us to discuss how could we try to have this kind of information because when we don't have it, uh, there's a lot of things we are missing in this picture. And uh, the data that I, that I bring show just uh, a small part of this reality, but uh, I think it shows uh, a lot. Um, I bring you um, different uh, data from different sources for what we can have. So I have statistics from um, the um, Ministry of Education, um, national statistics from, um, from census, um, and other, and other um, from Observatory of Secondary Students of School Pathways. Um, in, each, in each source, the way, they, they, the way we, we can approach Afro-descendant students, it's different. In some, in some, you just have the citizen status, in other places you have the place of birth, and in other places you have the place of birth of the student and the place of birth of the parents. So this is a, a puzzle that I bring you. Sometimes I'm using one, sometimes I, I, I'm using the other. Uh, but none of them is really um, accurate to what we want to, to, to study. And um, more and more it will not be accurate because um, we have uh, children that are Afro-descendants, that are born in Portugal, and their parents are born in Portugal too. And this is a reality that will be more and more often. Um, some of the BSs that we can find in this data, um, like I said, we don't have direct information, information about ethno-racial ethno uh, origin, so we, we go by uh, proxies. Um, we, we know that these surveys, these big surveys institutionalized by the state have some uh, problems in, in, um, in gathering information with the uh, populations and in territories that uh, feel that are or they are categorized like irregular or, or illegal or, or something like that. And uh, there is another issue, and, and Marta also talked, talked about that. Uh, in Portugal we have this huge population that was living, uh, it's half a million, uh, that came in the, the 70s from Africa, from the ex-colonies, and um, a part of them were born, were born in Africa, in Angola and Mozambique. Uh, and um, they come, in the statistics, they are counted as Afro-descendants. And this is a, a problem that we have, and, and we find it, and you will see, I will show you an example, that um, Afro-descendants from Angola, with Angolan origin, will have very different um, pathways in, in uh, the educational systems, in, in statistical terms. And I think that it's uh, because we are mixing all these different uh, populations. Um, how many, we don't know how many Afro-descendants we have in Portugal. So maybe we should ask how many are invisible. Um, but we can try with this different um, data that we have to, to make some considerations about that. Um, we know by you know, citizen status uh, from Palo, Portuguese speaking African countries, uh, we know that uh, in the global population in Portugal, they represent like 1%. Uh, in Lisbon, like 3%. But if we try to go at Lisbon and just in the youth population till 34, we have like 4%. Uh, if we use the other um, indicator, um, the place of birth, uh, you see these numbers will, will actually, uh, are actually higher. Like 3% in the, in the global population, 8% in Lisbon, and 5% in the youth population. Um, other work from Teresa Siabra, I've been, I've been involved in, in, in some of that too, um, 
used data from the Ministry of Education where we have the three places of birth of mother, father and the, the student. And we made a combination of the places of birth trying to, you know, to, to address Afro-descendant uh, students. And what we could see is that in fourth grade uh, you have like almost 40% of the, um, of the population in, uh, in Lisbon is from <laughs> Afro-descendant origin. And of course we are not counting the ones that are Afro-descendant but were born in Portugal and their parents too. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's an important uh, population in, 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 um, in Lisbon. We don't know uh, about these Afro-descendants that were born here and their parents too, but we don't know also nothing about Afro-Brazilians, for, for instance, uh, and black people that come to Portugal from different uh, places in the world. And, but that face some of the same problems that uh, the Afro-descendants did, that we can find in the statistics. To give you an, an idea of, of um, the territorial distribution, you can see by municipality that the um, Afro-descendant population, and here I'm using the place of birth, I'm always changing, I, I will always talk uh, about that, um, the place of birth using that, that indicator, you can see that they are in the periphery of, of Lisbon. In the Sintra, Amadora, in Amadora they are like 12%, uh, and I'm just talking about the place of birth, not using that great uh, that, uh, indicator that uses this, the three places of birth. And if we go by parish, Freguesia, uh, you can see that in Val da Moreira they are like 36%, and I'm just using the place of birth. Uh, in a Placel, 23%. So uh, there's a lot to, to make visible about these, uh, about these, these issues. Um, we don't actually have data that can tell us um, specifically where they are, but we know by a lot of research that exists that um, many of the Afro-descendants live in neighborhoods that are um, very marginalized. Um, and this if we see the other slide of the parishes and we see this one with the neighborhoods, they are considered uh, prioritary for intervention. Um, you can see that there's some overlap. Uh, we have to, to make more work in this, in this, um, about this, uh, but we can, we can see this um, segregation, this urban segregation going on without making, without having signs about where the black people should live or white people should live, but it actually happens. Going to data about education, here's a, um, a graphic from, um, from a work of Teresa Siabra, where I've, I've been also involved, and um, what we could see, and here we have the ethno-racial origin, you know, using like the three places of birth, uh, and what we can see, there's some inequality in, uh, in access to, to education, uh, but especially in higher education, you can see they have half uh, the chance to, to be in, uh, in university or in the higher education system, um, with youth from 18 to 34 years old. So it's uh, a big. Of course, Portugal has doesn't have like this big uh, access to 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 higher education, um, comparing it to, to other countries in, in Europe. But this uh, this gap, it's really it's really striking. Uh, grade repetition rates um, in Portugal. There's uh, this is a phenomenon that happens a lot, not just to Afro descendant, but to, to white, white pupils too, but it actually in the, in the first, I call it, um, I'm sorry, it said one, you know, like primary school, it happens three times more for the children that have um, nationality or citizenship status uh, from uh, Portuguese uh, speaking African countries. Like, and we all know, and there are a lot of uh, political orientations in the sense that in the first years, there should not be a uh, great repetition because it uh, marks a lot the relationship of the children with the school, but also the, from the school with the children because there are records that, that uh, go with the children wherever it goes. And um, 
it brings uh, more processes of, of uh, segregation, progressive segregation uh, with, um, in, their, in their pathway. Um, in the, from the f fifth grade to the sixth grade, uh, you have two times more uh, grade repetition, and this uh, goes along uh, till sec upper secondary education. We always have this uh, big um, gap. Um, and if you think here in upper secondary education, it's not just two times more, it's half of them uh, face grade repetition. So something is, is really blocking uh, their pathways in school. I brought this graphic too, just to, to you know, for us, maybe we can discuss this in, in the end. Why does you know, Portugal and other countries, but not others, uh, have such high uh, grade repetition rates? You know, in Portugal, this is a very um, regular instrument of uh, sanction of the, um, the, the, of the students. But in, in other places, in other countries, this is not used. It's an exceptional uh, instrument, and um, we, we, we need to talk about, about this. Enrollment rates in vocational tracks. Uh, in, in seventh grade till ninth grade, they have like 13 years old, 14, 15. Um, 22% of the children with uh, African citizenship um, are in, um, in vocational tracks. And we know that there are political orientations in that sense that we should delay the maximum we can this uh, moment of differentiation, of tracking. And um, what happens is that it's not exceptional for them. It's like 22%. For the Portuguese, are like 7% and we are talking about three times more. And um, in the secondary education, upper secondary, um, they are two times more in these tracks, but if you see the number 78, it means that almost all of them in the upper secondary uh, education uh, go to these uh, vocational tracks. If we think in the great repetition, you see that 50% uh, were facing great repetition in secondary education. So, uh, and in uh, the general tracks, the academic tracks. So the ones they are not going for the academic tracks, the, the 80% um, are in vocational. So going in one way or the other, you are facing uh, obstacles. obstacles. Um, this is uh, a graphic that shows, it's not about African descendants in specifics, but it shows what happens to the, um, to the students that were in uh, academic tracks and professional tracks one year after the diplomation of upper secondary. And they are having very different, uh, in, um, very different um, lives uh, after one year of diplomation, of graduation. 79%, uh, 80% of the, the, um, the students that were in academic tracks, they followed to, to, to university, to higher education, almost all of them. Uh, in professional tracks, just 6% of them. So if we think that 80% of the Afro-descendants, in the way that we could you know, uh, operationalize it in a statistic way, um, they, are, they are, have their access blocked to, to higher education. And we can see this here in this, in this data. If we um, see all the PALOP um, you know, citizenship, here we are talking always about, um, no, he is not citizenship, I'm sorry, it's ethno-racial origin, so it's the one that has the three, um, the three places of birth. Um, we see that all of them have uh, two times less opportunity to access to higher education. But if we see that only the Cap Verdean, Guinean and saint Dominion, and this is about the retornados that I, that I talked in the beginning, you, know, to, you see that it's five, time, five times less their access to higher education. So I think this has a lot to do with tracking, with vocational tracks, and uh, with a lot with um, urban segregation too,
because schools that are in these territories tend to, to have more vocational <coughs> tracks and to do it more, um, uh, more often. And so there, there's not the need to even to, to ask them if they want to go to higher education or not. They are just blocked in the, the 10th grade. Um, a question that many times people do when I do this presentation, it's about social class. I said, no, but this is an issue of social class because we know that African descendants come from families that are, you know, poor, that have uh, uh, um, professions with, uh, uh, with low uh, qualifications and they, they haven't studied so much like the Portuguese population. So one exercise that I've done with, some, with the data that I, that I could gather uh, was to try to see if for the same social class for the same uh, cultural capital background of the family, if there were inequalities, if the inequalities would persist or not. And what we can see, and I've done this with this data and data from other years, <laughs> and it's always the same, um, same reality. Actually, inequality reduces, but it doesn't disappear, and it goes always in the same direction. Afro descendants, even when they are from um, higher classes, social class, uh, they face uh, more um, enrollment in vocational tracks or more grade repetition. So it's always there. Class is important, of course, but they, there is this other part that we need to address, and that has to do with uh, institutional racism, um, not considering it as a um, a discrimination from one to one in interaction, but thinking it as a, a structural force uh, and phenomenon uh, that has to do with the relations of power relations um, and not just with this interpersonal uh, discrimination. Uh, in the same way that we think about uh, exploitation in capitalism, we never think that there is a bad employee or patronage. <laughs> that it's uh, discriminating the, the employees. We, when we think about um, paternalism, or, or um, we, we don't think that it's a, a man, that it's bad and it's being bad to, to, to a woman. It's a structural uh, phenomenon and we need more and more to discuss it and to address it as it is. So I bring some questions uh, in case uh, we need it and um, one has to do with this. How can we go from a debate uh, in racism, about racism, that it's not just interpersonal discrimination, and we go further and try to address it as a structural phenomenon, as an institutional uh, phenomenon uh, that operates uh, beyond the <laughs> in um, intentions of the people uh, in presence? Um, how can we collect data about ethno-racial origin in Portugal. Because if we don't collect it, if we don't collect this, we'll not know. In this moment, we know that in Portugal there are uh, classes there are in schools that are only constituted by Roman children. And we don't have ways to, to have access to information about that. I was discussing this uh, the other day in Ishkte, um, even with people that, that had to do with uh, education policy, and, and you were there too. Um, and they said, no, we don't need to know it because the, educational min the Ministry of Education knows it. But the public needs to know. But the groups, the Roman groups need to know, to use that information too. Um, third question, what kind of desegregation in school spaces and uh, curricular tracking <laughs> Uh, do we want? Is it possible to, defre to differentiate, to differentiate uh, without stratifying? Can we do that? Uh, uh, is it possible to desegregate school without desegregating the urban territory? Because schools and territory are very connected. Some of the segregation that we find in schools have a lot to do with this territorial effect. Um, should we, and this is a hard question, should we close some of the ghetto schools that we know that, that really are segregating, that really are uh, places of, of uh, massive marginalization? Um, 
Should we close them? Or are we taking out from territories that are already marginalized? One, are we taking a, the last resource, the, the last institutional resource in, their, in, that play, in those territories? Um, how to build a non-Eurocentric curriculum? <laughs> That's other question, and, and Marta has addressed this by the, the history books, but there's a lot of um, other um, ways in which this Eurocentric view um, goes through, through school. Um, what kind of anti-racist approach in teachers' training? Uh, will we still talk about this kind of uh, interpersonal discrimination, being tolerant, uh, or should we change this for, in, to another way of viewing anti-racist uh, policy? Uh, what policies of direct promotion of ethnic and racial equality in access to, our, to higher education? Um, we are talking about quotas. Um, we have space to talk about that in Portugal or not. And uh, for the least, the seventh, uh, what policy of representation of Afro-descendants in the fields of production and reproduction of knowledge as teachers, as scientific researchers? Um, and uh, that's all. Thank you.